Hi, and welcome to this clip going through um, a set of reaction maps provided by OCR on their website. Um, I want to stress this is not endorsed by OCR. It's simply my version of uh, expanding on it, looking at things like mechanisms, etc. Um, please feel free to use it as you wish, but I'd like to stress it is not an OCR endorsed um, video clip. Okay. As I go through this, I'll number certain reactions that I feel may need further discussion. And in this space up at the top right hand corner, I'll go through anything extra that uh, needs to be thought about when you're revising this. So if you look at the numbers, um, I'm going to go through each number, and you'll notice that some reaction routes have the same number. That means that they share something in common. It might be the mechanism, or it might be the type of reaction that's being um, carried out at this particular point. Okay, so the grey box will be where I'll put any reaction details or mechanisms that will need to be discussed as we go. So the first thing to consider is it's a radical substitution mechanism. There's homolytic bond fission going on in the halogen, and many possible products can be formed. So because the reaction is hard to control, It's uh, not very good for synthesis where you want to tr try and control the reaction products. So the first step is initiation where radicals are formed from homolytic fission of covalent bonds. In propagation, you get radicals reacting with molecules to make new radicals and molecules. And it's important to remember that HCl or HBr is often made at this stage as well when you're doing your mechanism. And finally, in termination, radicals collide with one another to form molecules. So it's worth remembering that there's many possible propagation and termination steps. And the more halogen molecules you have in your mixture to start with, you get further multiple substitutions taking place. So in reaction number two, uh, which is adding hydrogen halide across the CC double bond. The mechanism is electrophilic addition. So the idea of electrophilic addition across the carbon-carbon double bond now leads us to think about which carbon the hydrogen goes on to and which carbon the bromine or the chlorine or the other halogen goes on to. So the thing to remember is that Markovnikov's rule governs the major and minor products if the alkene is asymmetrical. So Markovnikov's rule is based on the idea that the most stable carbocation will be more likely to form. So the greater the number of alkyl groups attached to the positively charged carbon in the carbocation, the more stable the carbocation will be. So the increasing order of stability is primary carbocation, secondary carbocation, uh, tertiary carbocation. So just to recap, this means there is more carbon atoms bonded to the positively charged carbon on the carbocation. So reaction three can be considered to be a hydration because you're adding water to an alkene. It also proceeds by electrophilic addition with the acid behaving as a catalyst. So with uh, reaction number four, this is a dehydration because you're essentially removing water from an alcohol. It could also be an elimination, um, but you don't need to know the mechanism for this particular reaction for OCR. So the strong acid behaves as a dehydrating agent, and it's also important to remember that HCl wouldn't be used because then reaction two would occur because you've got a hydrogen halide, so you wouldn't be able to stop the reaction at an alkene. And also the acid must be concentrated, so your phosphoric or sulfuric acid must be concentrated for this one. Moving on to five, it's a nucleophilic substitution, with the nucleophile being an OH- ion, therefore the oxygen has a lone pair that it can donate to a data covalent bond, uh, in tune with uh, the definition for a nucleophile. And then uh, if we move on to number six, we've got a nucleophilic substitution again. Uh, this time the halide ion is the nucleophile. Again, it's got a lone pair that can be donated to a dative covalent bond. 
But there's a bit of uh, extra information needed here because it's not actually the sodium halide that provides the nucleophile. What we have to do is make the halide ion in situ by reacting the solid sodium halide with a fairly concentrated sulfuric acid to make sodium hydrogen sulfate and uh, HX. So HX is going to be your hydrogen halide that is the source of the halide ion. So looking at reaction number seven. This is another nucleophilic substitution, but this time the nucleophile is the cyanide ion. And the carbon on the cyanide ion has a lone pair, so the actual negative charge is carried on the carbon, not the nitrogen. And this reaction involves creating new carbon-carbon single bonds and therefore extending the carbon chain. And the role of this, the ethanol is as a solvent to dissolve all the species at the same time and ensure that they react by adequate mixing. So the source of the cyanide is usually NaCN or KCN. So the sodium cyanide or potassium cyanide would be considered the reagent because it's the source of the nucleophile. So moving on to reaction 8. In this instance we have a nucleophilic substitution again. This time the ammonia is the nucleophile because of the lone pair and the nitrogen. So the reagent is excess ammonia to ensure it goes all the way to an amine. If it doesn't um, have excess ammonia, you'll only get an ammonium salt. So the reaction type for reaction 9 is oxidation. We use reflux to ensure complete oxidation plus no product escape. So because it's complete oxidation, you've got to remember that there's two um, oxygen atoms being used, uh, as well as the one from your oxidizing agent, so we use excess acidified potassium dichromate and H2SO4 is our preferred acid. So it's always a good idea to be careful with the balancing of your O in square brackets and H2O in equations when you're writing them for this, this reaction. So in reaction 10 we're looking at a reduction. The mechanism is nucleophilic addition this time using the hydride ion or H- so the sodium borohydride should always be aqueous because the water in that aqueous solution is actually involved in the mechanism. So reaction number 11 is obviously an esterification. You could probably guess that from the product. If you use uh, the anhydride instead of a carboxylic acid, don't forget the anhydride functional group can actually break into two moles of carboxylic acid because it's essentially two carboxylic acids joined together and once it's reacted with water it will produce two moles of um, carboxylic acid so therefore you'll get two moles of ester for every one mole of anhydride. It's always worth remembering that if you're balancing an equation in this particular reaction. So reaction number 12 is going to be hydrolysis but because you've got an acid hydrolysis and an alkaline hydrolysis you've got to be slightly careful to get the products the right way round. So for an acid hydrolysis, the products will be a carboxylic acid and an alcohol. But with the alkaline version, you get a carboxylate ion and an alcohol. So for example, if you use sodium hydroxide, you'd get sodium carboxylate. Okay, so let's now go on to reaction 13. So reaction 13 is a, a nucleophilic addition this time. That's the mechanism and the role of the acid is it provides a proton for the intermediate. So you must list your reagents as acid and NaCN or KCN. And it goes without saying that equally water could be a source of protons here. So in reaction number 14 we're looking at a reduction hydrogenation in the case of the alkene and uh, it's also worth pointing out that nickel and hydrogen are commonly paired together. So the next thing to look at is number 15 that's hydrolysis and the conditions are that the acid has to be dilute and it has to be heated like it suggests in the reaction scheme but the side product here is NH4Cl ammonium chloride. So reaction 16 is an often forgotten one because there's only one of it 
but it's how we make acyl chlorides in the first place. And it has a sneaky habit of cropping up in exams, particularly the more up-to-date versions, where they actually need you to know about acyl chlorides. So please make sure you remember this. Uh, do it on a flashcard and go and make sure you commit it to long-term memory. SOCl2 is called thionyl chloride. So in the final reaction, number 17, you'll see there's lots of different examples of this one. They all undergo the same mechanism called nucleophilic addition elimination, which you don't need to know in detail, such as curly arrows, lone pairs, etc., and dipoles. But as you can see, there's many possible nucleophiles that can undergo this reaction with acyl chloride, and it's important to be aware of those nucleophiles. So why are they, why are they nucleophiles? It's because there'll be a certain atom in each of those species that possesses a lone pair that allows it to undergo a dative covalent bond. Okay, so now let's move on to some more organic. You'll notice that this is aliphatic compounds. Let's have a look at some aromatic compounds. So when we're looking at um, the synthetic routes through aromatic chemistry, whenever we get a substitution on an aromatic ring, it always goes by electrophilic substitution. So I'm going to leave this box here that contains the basic mechanism uh, using curly arrows. So reaction one is a nitration, obviously, because you're substituting the nitro group onto the benzene ring. So the conditions are that both acids have to be concentrated, and you reflux it at 50 to 55 degrees C. So the conditions um, are uh, on the screen, but the creation of the electrophile you need to be able to do the equation for that. So that's um, your two concentrated acids reacting together to make NO2+. Plus. And in the same vein, you have to be able to do the regeneration of the H2SO4 catalyst using the H plus that comes off at the end. So the second reaction, um, whether it's bromination or chlorination, proceeds by exactly the same mechanism. So I haven't put the mechanism up this time. You can refer to it in the top left of the screen. So this time I've put the creation of the electrophile and the regeneration of the AlBr3 catalyst. So the electrophile is a positively charged bromine ion, not a bromine atom or not a bromide ion, positively charged Br+. In the regeneration of the AlBr3, I've also included the fact that you have to have an HBr coming off the end. A lot of people forget this. So just giving a little highlight there just to remind you. So looking at reaction three, these are called Friedel-Crafts reactions. The mechanism and equations are the same as for reaction two, except obviously you have to make sure that you've got the correct, me um, the correct electrophile this time. Now it's important here to double check that you understand where the positioning of the positive charge should be. In some mark schemes they'll allow you to put it anywhere, but Considering that the carbon is the atom that carries the positive charge when it actually does the bonding, it's probably good practice to put it next to the carbon atom, as you can see from the examples I've given. So reaction number four is a reduction. Very important here to be aware that it's not involving the benzene ring. The benzene ring remains intact at all times. So it's actually the substituent that's undergoing change. And I've tried to highlight this by using the blue squares. So it goes from a ketone to uh, an alcohol, to a secondary alcohol. The benzene ring is actually no part of the reaction here at all. So the only functional group changes are on the substituent. It would be easy to fall into the trap, wouldn't it, of maybe doing this as an electrophilic substitution. It is not an electrophilic substitution. So reaction five is reduction. It's really important to remember the six H's in square brackets, particularly the two H2O's. It's often forgotten the water at the end, and people lose a mark for not remembering to put it in. So next you add some sodium hydroxide solution to remove excess HCl and make phenylamine from any phenyl ammonium chloride salt that may have formed. So reaction number six is bromination. The equation I've put in is for phenol. 
I do this because it's a similar ease of bromination for phenylamine as for phenol, because the lone pair on the nitrogen atom delocalizes into the ring. So it's also important to point out that the mole ratios of the bromine to the phenol. So a quick reminder to watch those mole ratios. So let's now go and have a look at uh, the phenols a little bit more. So let's start off by just clarifying that any substitution onto the benzene ring on a phenol is also an electrophilic substitution. But I'll highlight which ones of these three reactions are not. So reaction one is a bromination. That's definitely electrophilic substitution. It occurs at room temperature and there's no AlBr3 halogen carrier needed. And similarly, you'll notice that it's dilute HNO3. Uh, there's electrophilic substitution going on again. It occurs at room temperature, no nitrating mixture needed this time. So it's interesting to note that multiple products are formed uh, in this nitration as well. So reaction number three is not an electrophilic substitution. It's phenol behaving as a weak acid, and only strong alkalis can undergo this reaction with phenol. Other weak bases, such as CO3 2 minus or HCO3, will not do this. So it's occasionally used to distinguish phenols from other weak acids, because with phenols there's no fizzing due to CO2 when the carbonates are added, but with a carboxylic acid, you would get fizzing. 